Great, so I wanna start off with some basics of integrated pest management. This might be familiar to a lot of folks, um, but just in case, I thought it'd be good to cover some of the basics. And I'll ask to the co-hosts, if you see anyone um, gets in the waiting room, if you could please just go ahead and uh, admit them as well as we go, go along. Great, so starting off, what is a pest? Often we think um, when we see any kind of uh, we see insects or we see bugs on our plants or different kinds of things, we might think right off the bat, well, maybe that's a pest. Um, but as we see here from the photo, actually all three of these are um, either neutral or beneficial insects. Maybe they are predators like the lacewing um, or the parasitic wasp. Maybe they are uh, decomposers. Maybe they are pollinators. So when we're talking about pests, we're really thinking about organisms that damage or interfere with our activities. So it's kind of a um, very like anthropocentric or human centric view uh, or definition. And they might be other organisms that have an impact on human health or on animal health. And it's often they might transmit disease or could just be a nuisance. So integrated pest management, this is a sustainable approach to managing pests by combining the use of all the practical methods of pest control that are available to us. So this includes things like cultural, physical, biological, and chemical methods. And the idea is really to attain our goals as producers, minimizing economic health and environmental risks at the same time. So why IPM or integrated pest management? Um, there was this era of traditional approaches that went from ancient times, so these are things like cultural practices, which we'll talk about later, uh, until about the late 1930s, when we moved into this era of pesticides, really, um, starting in World War II and going through to about the 1960s. So this was that whole era of you know, better living through chemistry and the um, image, the little cartoon there at the bottom is, is actually um, from a real advertisement from the 50s. DDT is good for me. Uh, but when we came into about the 1960s um, with the book Silent Spring, where Rachel Carson made a really big splash, and we started to start to think about um, a more ecological perspective and seeing that in many cases, the pesticides were having negative impacts on non-target organisms. So in the case of DDT, that was had to do with uh, birds where the, their, it made their eggshells really thin, for example. So this was one of those first kind of um, red flags that maybe we needed to take a more holistic look and think of a different way to manage pests instead of relying solely on um, chemical pesticides. And that brought in this era of integrated pest management. So kind of integrating more of those traditional and cultural, and by cultural, I mean the things that we do in managing our, our farms and our production. Um, so that, that kind of, those kind of cultural approaches with also still using um, all the tools that are available, including chemicals, but just in a more judicious way. And then we can also think about, well, that's, you know, that's been the last 60 years or so and what might be new approaches moving forward into the future. So part of why we wanted to shift away from using a strictly chemical approach is this idea of the pesticide treadmill. Um, so the pesticide, you can think about when you're on, you know, you're on a treadmill and you start moving and then you, you know, you're running and then you get going faster and faster. Uh, and the idea with the pesticide treadmill is it's the same kind of thing where we're relying on a, on a chemical pesticide, um, and then we start to see things like pesticide resistance, pest rebound, or secondary pest outbreaks. We'll get into each of those in a moment. Um, and as these different uh, issues with pests come, come up, um, we find that we're needing to use more chemicals, spray more often, or use stronger, more toxic uh, pesticides. Um, so that's that treadmill where you, it's, it just kind of builds on, on itself and we end up in this, uh, this feedback loop or this cycle. So to look at each of these a little more uh, closely, pesticide resistance is something that uh, many of you might be familiar with. Um, and this is the idea that pest, we see that um, over time, pests are able to build up resistance or tolerance 
and they are no longer going to be susceptible to those pesticides that we're applying. And so pesticide use actually increases natural selection for this kind of uh, resistance. So the image here is showing, if you can see the little, uh, whatever kind of um, insects these are, the blue ones are the individuals in the population who are susceptible to this pesticide that we're spraying, this insect insecticide, and the red ones are resistant. So after the first, in the first generation, if we're looking at the top left, you see the population is mostly blue and we come through and we spray and most of the blue ones, most of the blue ones die. There's a couple that maybe we miss. Um, and then there's a red one who's resistant. But now, instead of having just one red one out of the population, here you see that about a third of the population are resistant. So then in a later generation, we see that those, those resistant individuals are, are become greater and greater proportions of the population because they survive and they're able to um, pass on their resistant genes. Over time, we end up with a majority resistant population and just a few individuals that are susceptible. So then we come out and we spray the same pesticide again, and all of a sudden you'll see um, that it's not very effective. And not surprisingly, since we've seen this uh, increase in the use of pesticides, we're also seeing this rise of resistance. So this is a graph from a Nature article in 2017, and the lighter green line on top, on top are arthropods, such as insects and mites. And these are all of the individual species that have, been, have documented some type of resistance. So the um, measuring here is this cumulative number of species. So we see that over time, we have more and more. And you can also see that, um, that during that time through the 60s and 70s and 80s, we see this really rapid increase um, in arthropods that are resistant to different uh, types of insecticides. We also see the same thing in weeds, kind of picking up a little bit later into the 70s, 80s. Um, 90s, but we know now that, and these are hundreds of individual species that have documented resistance. And in many cases, an individual species might be resistant to multiple pesticides now. So management just becomes that much more difficult. So secondary pests, uh, this is an example where if we spray for one pest and basically we create some kind of imbalance, um, then in many cases we'll see another pest explode in their population to fill that niche that's been created. Um, so this is an example from um, apple production. Uh, we see codling moth uh, was a major pest and spraying for codling moth created a void and then caused this explosion of parasyla. Parasyla was treated for, and then we saw an explosion of spider mites. Um, so this just as one example of how that kind of um, domino effect can work. And uh, it's been reported that about a one third of the most damaging insects in the US were originally, um, sorry, if you could all please mute too, that's super helpful, thank you. Um, uh, unless you have a question, of course, please chime in. So um, one third of the most damaging pests in the US were original secondary pests and only became major problems after the use of pesticides, meaning that they were there, but they were there and they were existed in the environment in smaller numbers. And it wasn't until that imbalance was created um, that their populations grew to the point of being uh, economically damaging. So IPM is really based on the science of ecology, understanding things like population dynamics, predator and prey relationships, like we were talking about a little bit, food webs, um, and also phenology, which are the relations between climate and per periodic biological phenomena. So think about things like periods of flowering, periods of dormancy. And it's a way of understanding that, you know, everything is connected and that these systems that we're managing as farmers or ag agriculturalists are uh, very complex. So how do we manage pests in these complex, complex ecosystems? Um, there's something called a PAMS approach, just 
another acronym, but prevention, avoidance, monitoring, and suppression. Um, so thinking again about different types of appro approaches and how we can uh, try to address pest issues from many angles. I want to run through some of the key steps in IPM or integrated pest management. And the first step is really correctly identifying the crop damage and the responsible pest. So we need to be a good detective um, and learn to recognize damage that we see on the crops and also feeding patterns if we're talking about um, arthropod or other insect, insect pests, for example. And in many cases, the damage is easier to detect than the pest itself. So um, we might start to see damage on, a le on the leaves of our plants, for example, and then we need to go in and look and try to, and try to figure out, is this something from, is this a nutrient imbalance? Is this some sunburn or some kind of other um, environmental factor? Or is this uh, a bacterial path some, or some kind of pathogen, a virus, or insect damage? Um, and so that's what it means by being a good detective. Because if we can't, we need to be able to identify what is causing the damage that we see in order to figure out the best op options we have for managing it. And this uh, image on the right here just shows um, different examples of leaf damage and that uh, understanding that the different types of damage we see in many cases are related to the different types of insects and actually the different um, types of mouth parts that they have and the types of uh, damage that they create. But we also want to remember that in many cases the pests could be um, at or below the soil surface. So here's some examples, um, beetle larvae, root aphids, cutworms, or wireworms. So if you do see, uh, if you're growing some kind of vegetable, for example, and if you notice some of your plants are dying back and you can't figure out why, it's a good idea, again, that being that detective to pull up a few, dig around, see what the roots look like, see if you see um, any kind of uh, worms or other, other pests that might be affecting them below ground. And we also want to remember all of our um, vertebrate and uh, mollusks, things like slugs and snails and other kinds of pests as well. Um, it's not just about uh, weeds, diseases, and, and insects strictly. So I think we're all familiar. Um, pigs, for example, are a pretty ubiquitous challenge across the state. So the next step after we've correctly identified the crop damage and the responsible pest is to learn that that particular pest's life cycle and biology. So we can see the best point to intervene. So this is an example with uh, diamondback moth, which is a really common pest of um, cruciferous vegetables. And this just shows that starting from the egg, understanding two to three days, then moves into um, the larval stage, and then eight to 10 days um, into a pupae, and then a, a three to four days uh, later that the adult is going to emerge. Um, and in this case, it's important, as, as an example, it's important to see, you know, if you are going to use something like uh, a BT, a Bacillus thuringiensis kind of spray, for example, as an intervention, um, if you spray that when they're in the adult phase, it's not going to have any effect. So understanding the life cycle so that you can know when they are most vulnerable and when your intervention will be the most effective. So the next step is to, once you understand the biology, then to establish an action threshold. And so an action threshold is really dependent on economic injury level. So the idea with integrated pest management isn't that we're bringing the number of pests down to zero, um, but rather that we're bringing it down to a level that is below the economic injury level. So this will really depend on the specific pest and your specific crop um, and also your cost of management. Um, so this is uh, just one example where, and that number of pests, it might be how many, you know, how many, how many aphids you see on a leaf that you sample. So you go out to your field and sample some random, a bunch of random leaves and you get that number. Um, so you have to kind of determine for yourself through experience what that threshold is gonna be. 
Uh, and this is a, really about cost and benefit because there's a cost to any kind of intervention, whether that's your time and labor or any materials that you're using. Um, and you wanna make sure that the benefit of that intervention is gonna be greater than the cost. And in some cases, there's also a cost of doing nothing, right? There's that certain amount of crop loss. So this is how you would determine that action thresh threshold if it's worth um, doing the intervention or not. So next you wanna monitor and sample for pest populations. So this is, a, this is again, um, right? So you establish your action threshold and then you need to go out and monitor and see where you are to make sure that you're not exceeding that for the particular pest of interest. And so for sampling, there's a number of tools you can use, things like basic sticky traps or pheromone traps that have uh, pheromone lures, uh, pitfall traps, and these other, other kinds of examples. So depending again on the particular crop that you're, or excuse me, the particular pest that you're trying to uh, monitor for. And then choose and apply a combination of management tactics. So this is an example of a full range of different kinds of management tactics and the, um, there are maybe others as well. Um, but you really want to start at the bottom of the pyramid. So first up, you know, prevention is the foundation. So if there are things that you can do to um, try to pre prevent uh, pest and, dis and disease issues, these might be things like cultural practices, including uh, field sanitation, crop rotation, use of cover crops, or growing resistant cultivars. Kind of avoid uh, the issues or help to reduce the likelihood of having issues. And the way to read the, the pyramid here, you know, the, the base uh, at the bottom, these things go from um, more on the prevention side to more on the, as you go up towards more uh, intensive interventions and also increasing toxicity as you go up. So, um, you know, field sanitation, there's no toxicity in, involved in that. That's things like uh, removing uh, infested or infected plant material from the field, for example. Um, then we have physical and mechanical in management. So those are things like traps, uh, physical barriers, mechanical removal, uh, biological control. So sorry, this, the image got a little bit overlapped here, but that includes predators, parasites, and pathogens. Um, and then finally, at the top of the pyramid are chemical interventions, starting with the biorational ones, or the tend to be more um, more organic uh, products, and then uh, more conventional or more chem chemical type, uh, more strong chemical types of insecticides, pesticides that are designed to either kill on contact or be systemic. So cultural control, as we mentioned, sanitation, things like removing overripe fruit, anything diseased or infested with insects, but also cleaning your equipment and tools and making sure that you're using clean inputs so that the seeds, the compost and so on that you're using, that you're not in introducing pests with any of those. Also crop rotation, um, trap crops where um, you're planting a crop to draw some of the pests away from your cash crop. Uh, resistant varieties is an excellent tool if they're available. Um, and then also proper planting, fertilization, and, and irrigation. So things that you can control to maximize airflow and vigor of your crop uh, so that they're stronger and better able to, to resist um, disease and pests. To host plant resistance, just a couple of um, examples where in tomato, for example, looking at fruit flies, uh, some of the larger, more beefsteak varieties tend to be more susceptible versus the smaller cherry varieties seem a little bit more resistant. Examples of some of the physical and mechanical control are things like um, traps, it could be uh, using some kind of lure, for example, uh, but also barriers, so including bagging fruit or having a screen house or floating row cover, hand picking, um, which is an option on a very small scale, but not uh, usually feasible at a commercial level. And then even just spraying high press pressure water on a small scale. So just 
literally physically removing them, washing them off. Now, biological control, um, again, predators, parasitoids, and pathogens. Uh, so the ladybug here being an example of a predator, the parasitic wasps down there on the lower left, and then Bacillus thuringiensis or BT as a common um, bacterial pathogen that's used for uh, control, especially of a lot of um, caterpillar or lepidopteran pests. And biological control, again, we're not bringing the pest population down to zero, um, but it's about lowering that equilibrium, that mean equilibrium population of the pest down below that economic injury uh, level or threshold. Um, so that, again, that you're, that that intervention is enough that you can still get the crop out that you want to see um, without too much damage. So then the last tool looking at pesticides, um, there's advantages and disadvantages like with anything. Some of the advantages are that they are effective, um, especially in the short term, if that you don't have a resistant pest. Uh, cheap, but really not necessarily cheap. A lot of these um, materials are actually very expensive. Uh, they tend, however, to be fast acting and simple to use, uh, to mix, spray, of course, follow all of the label instructions and the PPE to keep yourself safe um, and to use them according to the law, but doesn't require like that complex understanding of um, ecology in the same way. So they're less management intensive and the cost costs are offloaded. So um, some of the costs are those things like externalities, the larger impacts that they might be having. But it's a way to manage risk. It's thought of often as a type of insurance by producers. And then some of the disadvantages, we know human health impacts, um, especially to applicators, and also non-target risks, things like birds, fish, and so on. Um, and then risk of secondary pest outbreaks and that pest resistance that we talked about. So finally, after you've done all of the first five steps, it's important to go out and evaluate the results. So you want to see that the choices that you've made through your management are effective and then again make that judgment for your own system um, if, if you're seeing the results from using a, a more complex integrated approach. So with that I'll say mahalo nui for um, sticking with me through that and I'm sorry that I can't see all of you in person um, I also wanted to say mahalo to uh, Dr. Russell Messing, who had, uh, he was the uh, entomologist here on Kauai for many, many years, and uh, he created an earlier set of these slides that I shared with you today. <laughs>